Self-Interest by Dr. Tara Smith Recorded live at Lyceum Summer 99 Conference So this is Self-Interest and I'm Tara Smith. You should have gotten a handout, which is a simple outline. Is there anybody who hasn't gotten one? Okay, then one of the assistants will get that to you. We'll look at that together in a few minutes, so you don't need to be scanning it now. Okay, I'd rather not compete with myself, so I'll tell you when in a few minutes we can all look at it and you'll get some idea of what's on for the week together, okay? Okay, we're going to be spending the week examining self-interest, and along with it, egoism, the pursuit of self-interest, and altruism, the demand that you renounce self-interest and sacrifice for others. Clearly, self-interest is a topic dear to our hearts. But it's one that I think we oddly tend to take for granted in certain ways. It's a topic that doesn't get the systematic attention that a lot of other subjects within the objectivist philosophy receive. Why does it warrant attention? Why should we examine it and these related subjects of egoism and altruism more closely? For starters, one might say, because, in the words of Howard Rourke, the world is perishing from an orgy of self-sacrifice. Certainly in our culture, altruism is all around us. We are all familiar with the mantra, give something back. The voluntarism movement that has generated a lot of momentum in the past few years. About the highest praise it seems you can heap on anyone these days is that he contributes to his community. Communitarianism a term I'm sure a lot of you are familiar with, has very quickly been translated from an academic idea that scholars started talking about into something that Clinton now has advisors advising him on and you know, being implemented very directly in the political sphere. In the course of public events, whenever anything goes wrong or seemingly goes wrong, what's the usual, uh, uh, what's the usual culprit? What is it that is blamed? Self-interest, right? It's the self-interest of the gun manufacturers, or of Hollywood, or the students at Columbine High themselves, or the, the self-interest of Bill Gates, of those doctors who want to unionize now, or those dairy farmers, or those pilots who want to go on strike, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. In the political arena, certainly, altruism animates the destructive government policies that strangle our freedom and stifle our lives. The government has simply become a series of giveaway programs, mandatory transfers from the haves to the have-nots. You're all familiar, again, with restrictions on how companies do business, things like the American with Dis Americans with Disabilities Act, mandated family leave policies, regulations of doctors, insurers, antitrust legislation, anti-tobacco campaigns, etc., all designed to help the little guy to help give consumers their rights, right? Typically, the able and productive are to be penalized or sacrificed for the sake of the less able and unproductive. Clinton has just a couple of days ago concluded the poverty tour, where he was telling people in Mississippi and on the Indian Reservation, etc., how we can do better and we must do better for you who need us, right? Altruism. It extends to foreign policy. I'll stop soon because I know this is familiar and unpleasant. It extends to foreign policy as recent administrations have been falling all over themselves to demonstrate in Kosovo, in Bosnia, in Somalia, etc. We repeatedly sacrifice our military personnel, billions of dollars in military resources to help others in distress. Not because their well-being is vital to our genuine national interest, but because they need us. We can't simply stand by and witness suffering, we say. The future promises only more of the same when you've got George W. Bush campaigning as the compassionate conservative, and Al Gore, this hasn't gotten as much attention, but I read recently that Gore is now campaigning on the idea that we need to shift our attention from the budget deficit, where it had been for so long, to the care deficit in the country. I mean, clearly, altruism rules the world, and altruism is destroying the world. To battle altruism, we have to understand the enemy. Altruism enjoys the great press that it does, largely because of unclarity about what altruism and what egoism are. To better fight altruism, it's important to know what it is and what's wrong with it. 
as well as what we are after, what we want to replace it with, self-interest. So we'll be looking at this whole area, again, of self-interest and egoism and altruism. Still, even for all I've just said, the reason that it's worth studying self-interest is not simply to win cultural or political battles, important as those are. The stakes are also more personal, or more directly or immediately personal, you might say. The better we understand egoism, the better we can practice it. The more effectively, the more resistant we can be to sometimes, perhaps, slouching into elements of altruism. And most important, the more able we'll be to enjoy the reward of pursuing self-interest. Life. Happiness. So the aim of the course isn't simply to position you to make better arguments with that annoying guy at the office the next time you have an argument about altruism or egoism, right? If you're living with an incomplete understanding of self-interest, you're not getting your money's worth in life. That's the most important reason to understand self-interest as fully as possible. And I think there's a special danger with this subject among many facets of the objectivist philosophy. There's a special danger of not examining it as fully as is profitable. Because egoism can, egoism can seem like the easy part of objectivism. Epistemology is hard. Concept formation, basic axioms, even reduction, volition, that stuff gets tricky and you know, you know, you really get alert and you take lots of notes when you're going to talk about that stuff. You reread and reread, right? By contrast, self-interest, wow, that's like riding a bike. That's easy. Anybody can do that. On initially learning about objectivism, the endorsement of selfishness that you read in Rand probably felt very liberating. And you can treat it as if all Rand was doing was giving her blessing to something that you already knew and practiced, being a good egoist. But I think there's a lot more to it than we often suppose. With a fuller knowledge of self-interest, it can be, objectivism can be more fully liberating and more empowering for us, enabling us to achieve our self-interests more completely, more unqualifiedly. Because egoism feels good to most of us, there's a danger sometimes of embracing it on almost emotionalist grounds. Well, it feels good. It always felt right. Thank you, Ayn Rand, for letting me go ahead and do it. Well, yes, thank you, Ayn Rand, but there's a lot more to get out of Ayn Rand on this very topic than we sometimes realize. So again, if you neglect educating your grasp of self-interest, you're selling yourself short. In a sense, you might say, the motivation for this course on self-interest is self-interest. I mean, that's why I'm here. I just want to get more out of it, okay? All right, so our agenda. Now we can look at the handouts together for a minute. It's just one page, but it should have printing on both sides. That is the outline for the week. I've given you at the top there, A, B, and C, our three big, broad subjects, and then I've gone into more detail on each of the three. That's what the rest of the breakdown is. Now, I said we could look at it together. Having said that, I'm not going to read all through it. You can look at it more later if you want. Um, but I'll say this. We will be studying basically three things. The what, the why, and the how of self-interest. The course is organized in those broad units. What self-interest is, why it is proper, and how to be self-interested, what it requires. Okay, that's what the A, B, and C correspond to. Those headings are very broad. Uh, there are all sorts of things included under each of them. Under why be an egoist, for instance, I'm going to spend a fair amount of time on what's wrong with altruism. I want to try to probe that a little more deeply than some of us might have previously. And under the how of self-interest or the requirements, I'll spend a fair amount of time on our relations with other people. That's where we'll talk about issues like conflicts of interest and how there aren't really conflicts of interest between rational individuals. Okay. In a lot of the course, for some of you who are more experienced with objectivism, it may seem, it may be that all I'm doing is trying to make more explicit knowledge that's been implicit in the past. But I think doing that can be valuable. It can fortify your conviction to the rightness of being self-interested. I might also say that the first unit, 
pretty much what we'll be doing today and maybe a little bit into tomorrow is the most basic material which will pretty much serve as background from which I think the more exciting developments will come the rest of the week. We'll be concerned with both theory and practice. There will be a few somewhat abstract topics about the general nature of self-interest and egoism and altruism, what other philosophers have had to say on these things. There will also be some more directly practical uh, material, especially in the final unit, the last few days of the week. We'll be talking about some of what self-interest demands of us individually, personally. What are the kinds of things that we need to do to be more self-interested and get that payoff of happiness from self-interest? I might also say, I'm not going to cover history, really. That was the one thing in my course description I was relieved to find when I reread it a few weeks ago. I said, and we may do such and such about history. There wasn't space. I just had too much to do on all of these other subjects. And as it is, I think I'm skimming the surface on these other subjects. So we're not going to cover the history, OK? I'll say about three minutes on history today. And if, you, if you're interested, we can try to talk more about that in Q&A. Um, but just so you know what's in store. Finally, a few more administrative matters. The, the course didn't neatly fall into six tidy units, unfortunately. That would have been nice if we had a nice, clear, you know, starting and end point each day. It didn't work out that way, so we'll just start and move on, but I'll try to keep you at least broadly posted as to where we are in the outline. I will lecture for the most part and ask you to reserve questions until the end. I will try to save some time at the end of our session every day for questions, but I'll ask you, unless you didn't hear what I said or you're absolutely thoroughly confused and couldn't possibly understand another thing I say unless you have something uh, clarified immediately, I will ask you to hold your questions till the end, okay? Because I want to get through all the material uh, that you're paying for, all right? A reminder, this is a six-hour course as opposed to seven. So we go until 10 of the hour, OK? Let me just get a quick sense of you. How many of you have been with objectivism for three years or less? OK. How many for, let's say, three years to six? OK. And more than six? OK, OK, we have a lot of veterans, but otherwise a, a fairly, uh, you know, fair number of beginners, fairly even numbers of relative beginners and relative intermediates. OK. Correspondingly, of course, in the course, as always, is expecting that sort of breakdown. There will be some material that may be kind of basic for some of you, and other material that may be a little bit more sophisticated for others of you. I'll just ask your patience with that, OK? My customary disclaimer, I'm not an official spokesman for objectivism, what you're about to hear, represents simply my best understanding to date of this stuff. Uh, and it's a work in progress I'm, in my part. That is my understanding of it, all right? OK, uh, any questions, though, at this point? I will actually ask you, are there any questions about any of the business, the format, any of these details? OK, good, then we can get right to being more self-interested. OK, good. So first then, what self-interest is? That's the first thing to address, and correlatively what egoism and altruism are. You can't understand the propriety of egoism as long as you're working under misconceptions of what it is. So let's begin by simply clarifying terminology. Ethical egoism is the thesis that a person should act to promote his own self-interest. Now, I stress ethical egoism because you will frequently in philosophy run across another term. If you want me to repeat what I just said about ethical egoism, ethical egoism is the thesis that a person should act to, pr to promote his own self-interest. I say ethical egoism because it is often contrasted, is often confused as well, with a distinct doctrine, psychological egoism. We'll talk more about that later, so don't worry about it for now. And subsequently, I will not bother to keep repeating ethical egoism. I'll just say egoism for short, OK? But it's important to bear in mind that you may sometime be talking to a person who is confusing the two, failing to distinguish this other type of egoism, which we'll get to later on, OK? 
Now, Rand holds that selfishness, being egoistic, means, quote, concern with one's own interest. Concern with one's own interest. And, as you know, she advocated rational selfishness. The pursuit of the values required for man's survival qua man. Let me read you a slightly longer quote again from Rand. Quote, and don't, don't try to take this one down, it's long, okay? I, I can give you page numbers if you want later, but, or I can give you them now, but don't try to take this one down, okay? Just as life is an end in itself, so every living human being is an end in himself, not the means to the ends or the welfare of others. Ellipsis. Man must live for his own sake, neither sacrificing himself to others nor sacrificing others to himself. Close quote. That's in the Objectivist Ethics, page 27, the paperback version of, of uh, Virtue of Selfishness. What about altruism? Again, I'm going a little quickly right now, but this is all just background definitional stuff. Rand on the topic of altruism. Altruism is the doctrine that demands that man live for others and place others above himself. That's what it is, she says. She said that in the Fountainhead. Let me again quote her, but again, don't try to take this one down. This is from Capitalism, the Unknown Ideal. She wrote, quote, Altruism holds that man has no right to exist for his own sake, that service to others is the only justification of his existence, and that self-sacrifice is his highest moral duty, virtue, and value. Close quote. Is she misrepresenting what altruism is? Is she painting a straw man? Is she making it out to be a doctrine weaker than it actually is? Listen to some contemporary philosophers characterizing altruism. In the Encyclopedia of Ethics, which is a very respected book, okay, it's not some rinky-dink, uh, you know, well, anyway, it's not some rinky-dink book. It's very respected within academia. In the Encyclopedia of Ethics, altruism is defined as the view that moral goodness consists in always denying oneself for the sake of others. An introductory textbook in ethics characterizes altruism as, quote, the position that one should always act for the welfare of others. Another contemporary ethicist, Lawrence Blum, recognizes that people use altruism to mean different things. He's familiar with the confusions, confusions with benevolence and so on, that ordinary people commonly fall into. But even this ethicist acknowledges that the most typical meaning of altruism in ordinary usage is placing the interests of others ahead of one's own. In other words, as Rand wrote, altruism demands that man live for others and place others' interests ahead of one's own. By self-interest, all I mean is that which advances one's life. Something is in your interest if it is a benefit or boost to your life. It contributes, strengthens, enhances your survival. There are many different ways of doing that, but that's the distinguishing mark of something, a course, that is self-interested. Now, before trying to flesh out and sharpen our understanding of these concepts, which I've simply given you quick definitions of for now, it's useful to look at a little bit of background by looking at prevalent attitudes toward self-interest. So this is already point A2, okay? I'm not going to constantly do that, but uh, occasionally I'll do that. So let's just look again quickly at some prevalent attitudes toward self-interest. The conventional images of the selfish person are familiar. The selfish person is conceived to be greedy, a petty, crass materialist, right? It's Amelda Marcos and all those shoes a few years ago. Or Donald Trump is one of the other poster boys of uh, the conventional image. In the 80s, it was the yuppies uh, acquiring a lot and holding on to it and just being concerned with having the most chic, the most fashionable sound system or car or baby stroller or whatever. Because these conventional images are familiar, let's not dally here. Let's move on to more philosophical assessments of self-interest. In philosophy, self-interest is typically seen as an the antithesis of morality. 
Most ethicists dismiss egoism as unworthy of serious consideration. The dominant assumption is that morality, by definition, is contrary to self-interest. Again, let me quote you a few prominent contemporary moral and political philosophers on this topic. One ethicist writes, a moral man must be ready to go against his interests. Another, and this one is actually a communitarian who did for a while have a job in the White House as a domestic affairs policy advisor, okay, so he had Clinton's ear. Another writes that a theory is moral insofar as it appeals to individual motives other than self-interest. Here's one more, a little bit more complicated. This is a sort of grandfatherly figure these days in ethics, Kurt Beyer. He describes moralities... I mean, this is what is a morality, a moral theory or a moral system. He describes a morality or moralities as systems of principles whose acceptance by everyone as overruling the dictates of self-interest is in the interest of everyone alike. Now, you might think, well, look, he's saying there, right, he's saying it's in the interest of everyone alike to overcome self-interest. So doesn't that mean that he's really saying morality is about self-interest? But he, he continues, the best possible life for everyone is possible only by everyone's following the rules of morality, that is, rules which quite frequently may require individuals to make genuine sacrifices. Or as another popular textbook informs students, morality essentially involves consideration of interests other than one's own. Now again, I know even this from philosophy is not unfamiliar to most of you. It's not surprising. But what I want to call attention to is the offhand manner in which these dismissals of egoism are made. The equation of the moral with the selfless. In moral philosophy, characterizations of morality as antithetical to self-interest are typically treated as self-evident. This is not even worth dis disputing, okay, in, in the contemporary ethicist's mind. This is a mere preliminary that you note before you roll up your sleeves and get into whatever the truly contentious issues are in philosophy. So please don't have the impression that moral philosophers debate the merits of egoism. No. I mean, for the most part, and by for the most part I mean 90 plus percent, they don't, okay? Certainly, historically, to look a little bit at some historical attitudes, historically, the reception given to self-interest has not been much better. Many of the most influential philosophers, as you know, have been staunch altruists. Immanuel Kant, through all his contortions of the categorical imperative and his emphasis on duty for its own sake, when it comes to the substantive question of how a person should lead his life, what should I do, Kant? He was essentially advocating Christian altruism. Just a few tidbits as evidence of this. He wrote in the groundwork, his most widely studied ethical book, that virtue in its proper form is stripped of the spurious adornments of reward and self-love. The moral incentive must exclude all admixture of any interest as an incentive to obedience, to your being virtuous. In another work, he wrote, whatever increases self-love ought to be rejected from moral philosophy. Charity is a duty which we owe mankind. Charity is a debt of honor rather than an exhibition of kindness or generosity. In other, word, in other words, it's a debt. You owe it to this other person. He does concede Big reality concession from Kant coming here. He does concede that you have a duty to secure your own happiness. Why? Why might Kant think you would have such a duty? Because if you're not happy, you're not going to be a good soldier for the cause of helping the people in Kosovo or Somalia or uh, South Dakota on the reservation or wherever it might be. Okay. Now, what is typically taught as the chief alternative to Kantian deontology? as one big influential school in moral philosophy, the typical alternative that's taught is John Stuart Mill's utilitarianism, right? The greatest good of the greatest number. Well, utilitarianism, as you know, is just another variation on altruism. Sacrifice your self-interest 
for the interest of the community, the society overall. But again, the way philosophers view it, this is the big alternative. Okay? A few other big influential names, Karl Marx. I mean, clearly influential, right? He rallied nations to change their whole ways of living. What did he preach? From each according to his ability, to each according to his need. Pretty altruist formula, huh? He was also explicit in some lesser known writings in denouncing what he saw as the selfishness of capitalism. If anybody wants those quotes, I'll give them to you later. Countless lesser, lesser known figures as well, but people who were teaching in the universities in England and Scotland and on the continent in the 17th and 18th centuries were complete altruists. Now, we have to acknowledge that egoism has not been without its partisans over the history of philosophy. The ancient Greeks were by and large far more egoistic than just about anybody who's come since. As one contemporary observer has noted, for the ancient Greeks, self-concern was not only considered acceptable, but the foundation of the moral life. But you wouldn't know it from reading most contemporary philosophers. The standard interpretation is, well, the Greeks predate the issue of egoism. The label egoism is anachronistic if you apply it to the Greeks. What they advocated was prudence more than self-interest, and prudence is slightly less despicable than self-interest. Right? Now, I think something interesting here, part of what this reflects is the influence of altruism on people's conception of egoism. Ancient egoism, that found in Aristotle, for instance, that egoism was not elaborated in terms of a contest with altruism. Aristotle's egoism did not consist in the explicit renunciation of an altruistic ideal. Nobody, as far as I know, in his time was advocating openly a completely altruistic ideal. But his egoism consisted in counseling the achievement of personal excellence by developing qualities most conducive to your own personal satisfaction in life, your own personal happiness. That's the nature of the egoism that the Greeks, some of the Greeks, advocated, okay? Egoism, however, has not been seen by philosophers as really a sharply defined issue until it came into conflict with altruism. It's as if they allow altruism to coin the very concept of egoism. All right. Now, there have been a few other advocates of egoism through the years after the Greeks. Hobbes, for instance, you will often hear, was an egoist. But his endorsement of egoism really amounted to hedonism, which we'll be talking more about in a few minutes. Hobbes was also a complete subjectivist, and he didn't believe in free will, okay? So, I mean, clearly this is not going to be a big help or great ally in the cause of rational egoism. Spinoza is another figure who embraced egoism. And Spinoza had some good things to say about reason. And he had some very nice quotable lines about how my self-interest and your self-interest are really copacetic, are even good for one another, okay? So you can find some good things in Spinoza. But here, too, there are problems. He was another determinist. He was another subjectivist with some lines shockingly similar to Hobbes, I recently read. And he believes that the origin of obligation is social. Morality is about, or it originates from, disobedience to social rules. And another figure I should note, this is not an exhaustive list, but just my little quick trot through history, another figure we should note is Nietzsche. I was going to say a line on Nietzsche, and then about three days ago I finally looked at what else was going on at this conference besides my course, and I saw that there was going to be a course on Nietzsche, so I thought, well, one line might not suffice, because uh, Andy Bernstein is teaching some of you, perhaps, about Nietzsche. So I went back and I did a little more Nietzsche reading, and, and not, I mean, doubtless, not nearly as much as Andy has done, okay? And, but I mean, I have read and studied and sometimes even taught some Nietzsche in the past, so let me just quickly say a few things about Nietzsche. Nietzsche is the man who wrote, there are no facts, there are only interpretations. Nietzsche was not an advocate of objectivity. He didn't believe it was possible, okay? 
Truth is a term for the will to power in his view. So this man has no sympathy for objectivity. Nietzsche certainly did not endorse rational egoism. He preferred the Dionysian part element of our souls over the Apollonian one, the more reason-oriented aspect of our natures. I don't see signs from what I've read in Nietzsche that he really understands what self-interest is. If you don't understand what self-interest is, your advocacy of it cannot be ultimately constructive. And a fourth point, you will find a lot of very satisfying knocks on altruism in Nietzsche. But attacking altruism is not the same thing as understanding egoism. Avoiding death is not the same thing as living or loving life. Okay? So please caution about Nietzsche. Okay? In short, to wrap up this quick little historical foray, the philosophical friends of egoism haven't been much help. As hasn't been lost on egoism's enemies. They clean up by knocking Hobbes or Nietzsche and so on, right? They see some shoddy version of egoism being defended. They don't have a very hard time defeating that, and they conclude they have shown that egoism is a non-starter. But because what they're attacking are poor presentations of what rational egoism is all about, uh, they're not really getting the job done as they think they are. Now, that's it for two, background. Let's get to some more positive material. We've already defined self-interest and egoism, but we do want to probe further to flesh out our understanding of them. One useful means of doing this is by considering what self-interest is for. What is it aiming at? To know what self-interest is, in other words, it can be helpful to understand the purpose of pursuing self-interest. Because self-interest is a familiar concept used every day, without reference to the idea of an ultimate goal or end, it's easy for us objectivists to fall into doing that as well. But of course, in fact, self-interest is not a matter of acting for a series of unrelated gratifications. Self-interest represents an integration of aims, of actions, of all of your aims and actions, in service to a single overarching purpose, your life, or more descriptively, your happiness. Let me remind you uh, of something that Rand once wrote. This again is from the Objectivist Ethics, and it's a long quote. Quote, the maintenance of life and the pursuit of happiness are not two separate issues. To hold one's own life as one's ultimate value and one's own happiness as one's highest purpose are two aspects of the same achievement. Existentially, the activity of pursuing rational goals is the activity of maintaining one's life. Psychologically, its result, reward, and concomitant is an emotional state of happiness." Close quote. So, there are not two separate life, two separate tracks that we face in life. One leading to life, and the other leading to happiness. My real point here is, again, simply that we should consider the nature of happiness and see how it is completely entwined with life as the purpose and standard by which to determine what is truly in our interest, what is truly good for us. But by looking at that target of life slash happiness more closely, we can get a better idea of the sorts of things that we will need to do to achieve it and to get more out of our self-interest. Obviously, you could do a whole course just on the nature of happiness, okay? I just want to focus on two aspects. Let's just highlight two particular features of happiness. First, the fact that happiness is active in an important sense. A happy life is a function of its activity. I'll say more on that in a second. Let me just give you them, and then I'll elaborate, okay? So the first is that happiness is active in an important sense. Secondly, happiness is self-generated. It's an achievement earned for oneself by oneself. Okay, it's earned for oneself by oneself. 
So let me now elaborate a little bit on each of these two aspects of happiness. On how it's active. Again, I begin with a quote from Rand. They're interspersed in what we'll be doing all week, okay? Happiness is that state of consciousness which proceeds from the achievement of one's values. Well, that's right. She named it. That's the essence. But it could lead some people, that statement could lead some people to conclude that happiness is passive, an after-the-fact enjoyment, a destination that you try to reach after doing certain things. Happiness is that in part. Sometimes that feeling of satisfaction only arises at the end of a long struggle with a victory, achieving certain values. Many objectivists, for instance, have been happy recently at the news, particularly if they were involved in the campaign for there to be an Ayn Rand postal stamp, right? When they finally got the news it was going to happen, they justifiably were happy, right? And they might not have been all that happy during the ups and downs of the years, really, you know, during which people were writing letters and so on to try to make this happen. But again, it can be somewhat misleading when thinking about happiness as the overarching aim of your life to think about it exclusively as a result. Because, as Jonathan Rossman was saying in the course I just raced here from, you know, life is now. We're living now. We don't want to just be happy in our twilight years, right, when we're 75 or something. Life doesn't consist of action, then consciousness, right? You do something, and then you think or you feel about it, like a cycle of waking and sleeping and waking and sleeping. Consciousness, a state of consciousness, and happiness is a state of consciousness, consciousness is a constant accompaniment. It's always there. You can pay more or less attention to various things going on in your mind, but it's always there. It's not intermittent. To have a happy life... Something deeper than being in a good mood, being happy because your team won last night, or it's a pretty day, right? To be a happy person, to be deeply content with one's existence, involves more than occasional periodic episodes of satisfaction from achieving something. In a certain sense, for the ideally happy person, happiness is always percolating because his life is a continual stream of achieving values. Now, I, I qualified that. I said, in a certain sense, it's always percolating, right? I qualify that because that might be either an overstatement or not the most exact way of making the point. I certainly don't mean that the truly happy person will never experience disappointment or frustrations or pains or bad moods. I don't mean he's always in a good mood. Stop any truly happy person any hour of any day, and he's pert and perky and chipper and, you know, really annoying, okay? <laughs> um, obviously, a, a truly, basically, fundamentally happy person can have hard times, can suffer significant losses, and can feel them. I mean, you know, if he's healthy, he will feel them, and the feelings aren't always going to be positive. But happiness refers to the deepest kind of satisfaction that you can have. And that's a function of your own actions. Just as life is a series of, or let's say life is an ongoing activity, an ideally happy life refers to that series of actions that life is being characterized by a person's achieving his goals and enjoying the corresponding psychological satisfaction. In the broadest terms, what makes a life happy is its being led in a life-furthering fashion. A person will be happy when the series of actions that constitute his life proceed along a life-promoting course. Happiness comes fundamentally from life-enhancing living. So again, I stress, happiness is a function of activity. It's a mistake to think of it simply as a separate, later outcome. In The Fountainhead, Rourke said that to get things done, one must love the doing. Others' pleasure in his work was not his motive, not his reward, not his reason for doing them. 
I quote him, this is a page later, I quote him, Rourke, the only thing that matters, my goal, my reward, my beginning, my end, is the work itself. In other words, his happiness is in the doing. He didn't work hard just so that he could stand across the street from the construction site every once in a while and feel, ah, yeah, I'm happy, I'm satisfied, right? He didn't then scurry back to the office so that he could visit another site a few months down the road and get to feel happy again then, right, with no happiness in the intervening months. His happiness was in the hours of doing the work, solving the hard problems, creating the buildings. Again, the point isn't that the happy person never faces defeat or failure. Work sure did. So do we, real people, including the most successful and most virtuous real people. Given the defeats that we sometimes suffer, you might wonder, how can you be happy then? How can you feel satisfaction from the achievement of values when some of those values aren't being achieved? Well, let's note this much. By living properly, rationally and virtuously, you are achieving some of your highest values. Reason, purpose, and self-esteem. Right? You can't guarantee, you can't control everything, everything else that's going to happen to affect your values. But if you're doing honestly, truly, truly your best on the things you can control, you are achieving, again, the most important values, the ones that are up to you, even while you're facing certain defeats. Okay. All right, so happiness is active. It's in the doing. Let's get to the second aspect that I wanted to highlight of happiness. Since happiness is a function of living well, and since a person leads his own life, only he can live it well. Thus, happiness must be self-generated. Whether a person is happy is essentially up to him. In Galt's speech, Rand writes that only one's own virtue can achieve happiness. Rourke in The Fountainhead, switching books, Rourke suggests this principle, the idea that it's self-generated, at one stage saying to Peter, I don't think that one man can hurt another, not in any important way. Neither hurt him nor help him. The idea being, it's each man for himself when it comes to living and achieving happiness. Each is on his own track. Happiness is something that's got to be done for yourself. A little bit more concretely, consider the agreement between Rourke and Keating for Rourke to design Cortland. Peter will receive all the money, all the praise, the career boost, according to the agreement to keep secret Rourke's actually designing the building, the agreement that they make. So why does Rourke agree to it? He's rational. He's smart. He's selfish. How is this in his self-interest? Peter raises this very question. Everybody would say, you're a fool, Howard. I'm getting everything. Part of Rourke's response, quote, You'll get everything society can give a man, ellipsis. I'll have what nobody can give a man except himself. I will have built Cortland, close quote. In other words, Rourke is better off getting to do this thing. That's what will enhance his life. What others can give him, the accolades and the money that Peter will receive, are not crucial to Rourke's self-interest. Happiness is self-generated. Obviously, a person can be seriously affected by events beyond his control, for good or for ill. A paralyzing car accident, the right card in Vegas, can bring lasting repercussions on your life. Similarly, certain external goods, minimal health or well, or uh, minimal, I'm sorry, got that wrong, not minimal health, minimal wealth, you know, at least a certain amount of money to, to get by decently, and health, these things are necessary for happiness. Okay, I'm not saying they're necessary for virtue. I'm saying they're necessary for happiness. But the thing I want to call attention to is that they're not sufficient. 
the core of happiness resides in how a person manages what lies within his control. Whatever good or bad luck a person experiences, its ultimate impact depends on what a person does with it, on the ends that he puts it to, and the rationality of his avenues of pursuing those ends. People squander opportunities and good luck every day. So while external events can be more or less conducive to a person's happiness, insofar as happiness is a function of one's activity, it is an end that a person must attain for himself. The upshot of this is you can't make other people happy. You can only give that to yourself. Happiness can't be transferred from one person to another. However well-meaning or loving or generous another person might be, right? I mean, you can be talking about your husband or wife, however much you want to solve this problem or get the, the other person out of this depressed funk he's in or whatever. Can't, can't do it. You can't hand it to another person. You can give all sorts of help, material and spiritual. That is real, genuine help. But you can't live for another person. You can't achieve values for another person, and you can't impart to another person the satisfaction from achieving values that happiness is. Happiness is inescapably a function of how a person leads his own life. Okay, so that's all I mean by stressing the self-generated aspect. All right, we're moving right along because I have a lot of material. Let's see. All right, let me just get started on this next stuff before I stop for questions, okay? Let's move on now to point four. Having anchored self-interest in the purpose of life and happiness, saying, okay, that's the aim, that's what we're after, that's why we should be self-interested. Doing that should make it fairly easy to see certain things that are widely misunderstood by non-objectivists when it comes to this subject of self-interest. In particular, egoism, or the pursuit of self-interest, is not emotionalism, or hedonism, or subjectivism. Okay, those are all on your outline, and I'll be elaborating on each of them. So egoism is not any of those things. Self-interest is objective, long-range, and spiritual. And again, I think these are aspects of self-interest and of the pursuit of self-interest, which the clearer we are in understanding them and the more explicit we are in understanding them, the stronger position we'll be in to resist a lot of both the arguments of other people and the temptations that we ourselves are sometimes tempted into when it comes to being self-interested or altruistic. Okay. All right, so let me at least tackle the first. Egoism is not emotionalism. Interest must be gauged rationally, rather than emotionally. At root, that's because interest must be measured by the same standard as all value, life. Rand explained how reason is our means of survival. It's our means of determining what serves our lives and what's, what detracts from our lives. The fact that we must employ reason for these tasks implies that emotion is not the appropriate tool. My life, my interest, is not advanced by following my gut, my mood, my feeling. Now, emotions are terrific things. Don't leave home without them. But they are not a means of deciding whether something or someone or some action will promote your well-being. Confusion is somewhat understandable in this realm. People can easily inflate the role of emotions in self-interest because self-interest feels good. So they think, if what we're after is a good feeling, feelings must be the barometer of interest. But that's a mistake. Happiness is satisfaction from achievement of genuine values. But emotions, as you know, are not a reliable means of determining how to achieve values, or even which things are rationally valuable. Following emotions can lead you, for instance, to treating someone worse than he deserves, violating the principle of justice, and hurting yourself and your values in the process. Emotions can lead you to make decisions on the basis of wishful thinking 
rather than a realistic assessment of the circumstances, the odds, the relative value of different options before you, violating the principle of honesty and hurting yourself and your values in the process again. So the lesson is, just because happiness feels good, don't assume that feelings or emotions are the test of happiness, what advances your life. Life is the standard of value. What serves your life frequently feels good, but it won't always. And it's important. I think we tend to separate our understanding of the basis of the objectivist ethics and all of that business about life is the standard of value. A lot of people, I think, have that in one component of their understanding of objectivism and self-interest someplace else. Again, in part because self-interest seems so natural. Okay? You want to integrate the two to remember that life is the standard. And that will, I think, help keep you from falling in the, into the temptation of emotionalism or confusing emotionalism with the pursuit of self-interest. Okay? Especially when so many of the people around us present self-interest as grounded on that or seeing it as simply the pursuit of, well, what feels good because self-interest is supposed to feel good. Okay? All right, now if we're supposed to end at 10 of, I ought to leave some time for questions. So are there any questions for now? I mean, I hate to tell you, but if there aren't, I have plenty more. I could I'm run behind. But let me give you a moment to collect your thoughts from this assault. And uh, push on. Yes? Uh, on uh, self-interest, the relationship between self-interest and happiness on a day-to-day -day basis, um, I, I like to think that there are big values and little values and that in a normal day you'd have so many little values achieved that it would add up to happiness in the process. Well, I, I mean, I agree with you that there, not all values have equal status in our minds, in our commitments, right? We have, I mean, I hope most of us have a lot of values in our lives, but a lot of them weigh a lot more than others, right? Now, the achievement of any of them feels good. You know, you, you feel good when you, you, know, you hit the, the serve you were trying to hit on the tennis court. That feels good. It doesn't feel as good. It doesn't make you as happy as some longer range, more difficult thing that, that, stands, you know, that stands in relation to your life, uh, a greater positive, has a greater positive bearing on your life overall, okay? But I guess I'm a little bit unclear as to exactly what you're asking. Well, a lot of the little achievements add up. I don't think they'll add up to the same as uh, the big achievements. I don't think it's, well, be committed to the right career. Or, you know, look, just hit a slice serve and a kick serve and a twist serve and take up golf and get the right kind of putting. You know, and if you take up, you know, 20 million of those, well, you know, you and work are in the same place. Uh, and why not? I don't think that's just a subjective matter of taste. I don't think that's just arbitrary. A lot of little values aren't going to be enough to sustain your life. You've got to go after the right kinds of values, the ones that are most fundamental and central to survival. Okay. But, but I think that achieving lots of little values as you go is what loving the doing really consists of. No, I, I think that's true, and I don't, I mean, I love, I mean, if you love values, you love values, and you love all of them, right? You want to populate your life with values such that you really get a kick out of the little values. So I don't mean to denigrate the little, I mean, I don't mean to knock them. I don't mean to say they're bad or they're beneath us. Hey, you know, life is in the moment, and it's all sorts of values that you should be going after. You have to keep, you know, a, a, a rational perspective on which are more important, yeah, and not kill yourself when your team loses, Right? You might have invested in a certain team and care that they win, but even when the Giants lose, Tara has to pick up the pieces on Monday morning. Okay? Okay. Other questions for now? Should I go on then for now? Well, if there, yes. I don't know if the question, but um, in the achieving, achieving of happiness and going along, uh, this person's going to feel great. All, not all the time, but a lot of the time, right? The person achieving values. Yes, and being happy. And he, if he doesn't have other big psychological problems, too. Okay. okay. So next, maybe there's a question here that isn't this going to, wouldn't that person feel like lighthearted in a certain way? Like very, just able to take on life and feel happy in it and being able to like kind of joke about it in a way, but seeing it serious and being, I don't know if I'm well, putting this correctly, but okay. do you know what I'm saying? Or, Excuse me. If you're saying wouldn't, if you, you know, 
if you are in the process and have a good track record so that this isn't just a temporary glitch, you know, a good two week or two month or two year period, but you're a person who you, you achieve your values and they are rational, well chosen values, isn't that going to lend a certain lightheartedness to your life? Yeah, I would think it would. Again, in a psychologically he healthy person who isn't mired in certain other, you know, really warped premises, I would think that this would. One of the things I will talk about that's on your handout later in the week is the image of the person without pain or fear or guilt. That's something that I want to probe a little bit. And I think this kind of lightheartedness, or you might also say a being at peace with the world or with oneself from a record of rationality and correspondingly success in achieving values would lead to that kind of thing. So yeah. Mm -hmm. Yes. Would, would it be fair to say that happiness is not an emotion, or, or it's the contrast that emotions are also states of consciousness? Well, I mean, emotions are states of consciousness, for sure. Okay. And I mean, happiness is a feeling. I don't, I mean, I'm not denying, I'm not disputing Rand's definition of happiness as a state of consciousness that results from certain things. By stressing the active, I just wanted to say, don't look at it as, well, I'll be happy on the weekend you know, and miserable or just sort of out of it, not conscious of how I'm feeling in the in-between time. That's what I wanted to stress by the active part, the doing part. Okay. Yes? Question about history and understanding the enemy. Um, I read a lot about how in the Enlightenment, uh, religious views of life were under assault, and yet Kant, from our discussion, managed to save the Christian ethics. Was he the, the only vehicle, or was he the, the main vehicle for allowing the Christian ethics to survive the Enlightenment assaults on religion, or I were there other so. mechanisms? I don't think he was the only uh, means of keeping this alive or going, okay? I'm not a real historian of philosophy, I have to say, but believe me, there were plenty of, yeah, no, there were plenty of people educated by a few still pre-Enlightenment figures, but completely meaning they were educated by pre-enlightenment figures, right? But the education, the textbooks that were written, I mean, I'm thinking of Bishop Butler in particular in Britain, who was a clergyman, who was a, you know, a hardcore altruist, right? Wrote a textbook used for generations by, you know, people in all the good schools in Britain, right? Who went on to become the future philosophers and so on. I mean, these people were just mired in the idea of altruism, Christian altruism. So, no, he wasn't, you know, the most influential, yes, but not the only life source, lifeline they had. Okay, if you want to call it a lifeline. <laughs> yeah. We only have about one. Yeah. Okay. Um, really more of a psychological question, since. Um, but when you're going through the process of doing something that you don't like, for example, I'm going to be going for my PhD, starting my master's next year, and the stuff that I have to learn, I've actually asked this before from other objectivist intellectuals. It really stinks. I mean, the stuff that I have to learn, it's just, it's awful. But the goal, the end goal is what I want, you know? So, I mean, how do I be a Howard Rourke when I feel like I have to go take a shower after after a couple of classes, you know? Yeah. I mean, how do I enjoy the doing? I mean, the, what I've right. done is approached it, and it's and it's just, it's just not, it's not thoroughly enjoyable doing it along the philosophic detection sure, line. Sure. It's just it's not. not. Right. It's only goes so far, so... Okay. I just wonder if you had any advice. I'll say a couple of things. One is, I think that is in part a psychological question. At the same time, frankly, a lot of what we're doing in this course, even though I'm a philosopher, okay, a lot of what we're doing, especially by talking about happiness, is psychological. But I mean, life is psychological, and you can't ignore it, and you can't completely try to compartmentalize and say, well, that's a separate issue, okay? So we have to talk about these things. I mean, I think a lot of what you have to do is to focus on the positive, by which I mean your goal. I mean, if you have really thought this through, thought through how nasty and miserable and unpleasant this is going to be, but still decided, I think it's going to be worth it because of what I want, because I see, you know, a life as a philosopher is what's really going to make me happy, then by saying focus on the positive, I mean focus on that, what you're after. I don't mean focus on the little things that go right in the day, though that couldn't hurt, okay? But I mean, you've, just, you've got to stay riveted to your goal and what this is all for. You're going to face muck, right? And it's not going to feel good, but you know that, and you don't, in a sense, you don't grant it too much importance. You under, you're accepting that going in, right? So you're not going to be surprised by it, and you're facing up to it and still calculating and saying, this is going to be worth it. 
Now, obviously, there may be a few occasions where you have to reassess. You might decide in a year or two, this is worse even than I imagined. Then you have to seriously reassess. Is it really going to be worth it? Just from my own experience, I'll tell you, it's funny. I've just been thinking this a few times recently. The best investment I ever made was graduate school. <laughs> Not because graduate school was a picnic. They told me after one semester, the guy who did ethics said, you should try something else, honey. Um, why was it the best investment I ever made? Because I love what I get to do now. Because I'm really having fun getting to, t you know, it's like I've been doing it a while now, and yeah, I really enjoy it. So I was like, ooh, good, made a good decision there. But it, I don't know. I mean, maybe you and I can talk more about it in terms of just any specifics, but I don't know that I'd have much more to say. Okay. All right, well, we are out of time, so I'll see you tomorrow.